So welcome to Slow Jams. We're going to turn it down now. And we're going to talk a little bit about the myths of therapy. Ideally, this will help people see like it's not what you think it is. And even if it is what you think it is, try it anyways, because it's sure shit better than feeling bad. I love those folks who are like, well, yeah, I'm in therapy. Do you know what I do? Of course I'm in therapy. And so this isn't really about anybody else. Myth bust one is you don't have to be crazy to hang out with us. If you're going to do it, can we definitely encourage you to try it out? Be open minded. Do not set yourself up to lose by going in there with the intent to bust it. It's the first responder, the first to get the call, the first on scene, greeted by God knows what, pushed beyond the limits that they don't even set. Then what happens? You're listening to After the Tones Drop. We're your hosts. I'm Cinnamon, a first responder trauma therapist who founded our practice after seeing the need for specialized care following a local line of duty death. And I'm Erin. I'm a first responder integration coach. We help first responders receive transformational training, therapy, and coaching. Now we come to you to explore, demystify, and destigmatize mental health and wellness for first responders. Our show brings you stories from real first responders, the tools they've learned, the changes they've made, and the lives they now get to live. The whole Mythbusters idea is a lot of fun, actually. It is. Especially for people like us who are advocates who are like, everybody could use therapy. So welcome to Slow Jams. We're going to turn it down now. And we're going to talk a little bit about the myths of therapy. The myths of therapy. Bow, chicka, wah, wah. Like, this will be the next series of Mythbusters on the Discovery Channel is people um, being convinced that therapy works. <laughs> 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 I like that. So, Aaron, why are we doing a Mythbusters around therapy? A couple reasons. One, it's super easy for a podcast like After the Tones Drop to feel like heavy and dark. And the Stay truth in. is, it's serious stuff, but also we can still have fun and still have joy in our lives while talking about I, all of this stuff. Well, people say all the time, like, oh, my God, your job has to be so hard. I, I can't imagine how you hear about all of this stuff every day. But the reality is I, we laugh mm -hmm. in sessions. Like, obviously, we also do some crying. Um, and, and we, we also, definitely don't laugh at the stuff that yeah, yeah, like, should not be laughed at. Yes, there's a time and a place. But it, it's not as if every single moment is dark and heavy. And I think a lot of people who have never been to therapy, you know, they see it on TV or they took a psychology class in college and they can think of like Freud. So just even on here, I would hope that people figure out that therapists don't have to look a certain way and can be, you know, humorous and personable. But mm -hmm. also like this is, mm, this is how we act when we're in session too. Right. So what you see is what you get. Yeah. Yeah. We're not just all like wearing our glasses with our little notepad sitting in a corner while like, you lay on a, mm. while you lay on a, there's no couch laying here. Okay. Wait. Okay. There's chaise laying. Yeah, I, I do have a chaise lounge, but everybody loves it. So especially after a long day at work, you just kick back and relax, but it's not like what definitely what you see on TV. It's not right. Like we're making eye contact if one chooses. Like I'm <laughs> my face isn't down in a notebook, mm -hmm. you know, where I'm going, hmm, interesting. Tell me more. Or, you know, like, tell me about your parents. Although I do ask sometimes, but we'll get to that in the myths. Yeah. So you, as sick as it is, people that are already clinicians you know, we watch our child go through a hard time or people around us that we love. And it's especially our children. It's just kind of like, well, I'm just getting ready to, them ready for therapy. Yeah. Give them something to talk about with their therapist. Well, and I, I think that there are probably a lot of people in my life that either confront me and like my husband is really good at this. Stop therapizing me, Cinnamon. 
and I don't even know I'm doing it. I just like that is who I am and how I Uh ask questions and my curiosity and how I, you know, encourage people to talk about problems. Um, But then I think there's got to be other people who don't even know that it's happening. And I and I'm not sitting here like diagnosing the entire world. But I I do think that once you kind of do this the same way I see our first responders that are if my kid is a paramedic and my blood pressure is going off the charts, I'm probably going to say, can you check like do are we having an emergency? Right. Mm -hmm. So I think people do kind of expect us to at least have a third eye of some kind. But I do love those moments where I can just like be like, man, that is some fucked up shit. I'm really sorry that you're going through that. And I don't even know what to tell you to do. Where you just get to be human. Exactly. And really, it's not our job to tell people to do anything. Right. Definitely not me as a coach. It's not my job to tell you to do anything. Yeah. It is my job to support you in finding the answers. But we'll get into that later about the difference between therapy and coaching. But nonetheless, we just thought it'd be fun to kind of like talk about some of the things that we have heard people say or we've seen throughout the years about the myths of therapy. And ideally, this will help people see like it's not what you think it is. Yeah. And even if it is what you think it is, try it anyways, because it's sure as shit better than feeling bad. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And here's the other thing, like we are not cutouts, right? So just because you have a poor experience with one therapist doesn't mean that there isn't a therapist out there that you can connect with and it be really effective. And also, if you've connected with a great therapist on your first try, and then for whatever reason, that therapeutic relationship ends and you have to find another therapist, you can connect with another person, another therapist who isn't the same as that first one. So maybe it's not the second one you try, maybe not even the third one. But I think a lot of people have the belief that they can only go to one therapist at a time Mm -hmm. and, you know, because of insurance. But one of the the ways that I would say this is you get to interview a therapist. Yes, there's some legwork that you have to do as far as like intake documents and whatever. But I don't see any problem with someone going to a therapist saying, I will let you know if I want to schedule another appointment. And then, you know, going to two or three different therapists to see, okay, what feels the best for me? It's if it doesn't feel like a good fit please move on, Mm -hmm. find another therapist. And part of our responsibility is also telling you if it's not a good fit. Yes. You know, we are human and we are dealing with our own implicit biases and our own life experiences. And we may encounter somebody in therapy that we know right away or know a little bit down the road. I am not going to be helpful for this person. And so it becomes my responsibility to share that with a client, just like it's a client's responsibility to share it with me. Mm -hmm. So did you just kind of throw in a myth buster right there when you said people think that they can't shop around because of insurance? Yes. You just did. I just did. I don't even know if that's on our list. It's not. But you know what? Which one is that is obviously there's a couple on here that are my favorite. But please, I love this whole line of like. Well, only crazy people or mental people need to talk to therapists. And I haven't lost my mind yet. And I'm not having a nervous breakdown. So I don't need a therapist. Can I add in there? This, this is a, a direct quote from so many people. It's not like I'm suicidal. Mm-hmm. I'm like, can we raise the bar mm-hmm. a little bit? Like, trust and believe that that's not going to be when you're reaching out. So you don't have to... <laughs> Be any particular thing. You can just say, hey, things are going well and I want to keep them that way. So when I have a critical incident, I'm going to check in with a therapist. Mm -hmm. I'm going to develop a relationship with a therapist. And that way I have the ability to go somewhere just to debrief, just to get it off my chest, just to process it with somebody outside of the realm of who responded. So I can take care of it. It's done, processed, put away when I go out on my next run. If you're a human being 
with a pulse. There's something in there that it would be beneficial to have a therapist because therapy isn't about necessarily getting fixed. And now, of course, like when there is an obvious problem, going to fix the problem and come up with some solutions, of course, have a treatment plan, of course. But also, even if something isn't going awry right now, having that preparedness to know, like what you were saying with critical in- incidents like is- Like a primary care physician. Yeah. I don't get one just when I'm sick. Uh-huh. I establish care when I move to a new place. Boom. So yeah, you don't have to be crazy or mental or be having a nervous breakdown or be suicidal or feeling like you're losing your mind. You don't have to wait until it gets that far in order to utilize therapy. So myth bust one is... You don't have to be crazy to hang out with us. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It helps. <laughs> but no, <laughs> you know. Just no, but I think, yeah, it's not because something is wrong. Mm-hmm. And I have a therapist. Most of the therapists I know have a therapist. Yeah. It's really about... You know, I say a lot of times I'm a puke bucket because people just vomit, right? And then I get to take my puke bucket (laughs) and go dump it into somebody else's puke bucket. And while we're doing that, we still get that feedback of like, that sounds really hard, or I'm sure that's difficult for you, or holy shit, I cannot believe you're still here standing. Mm -hmm. You know, like where it validates that you're having a thing happened because a thing happened. And that is one difference about specializing in this group is I don't always deal with people that have like those organic mood disorders. And and yes, they are among the entire population. So first responders are not exempt from that. But really what people come and see me for is the things that they've witnessed or that have happened to them over the course of the job. Or whether it's cumulative or chronic um, or something acute. But it's not because, like, I don't treat some layperson off the street who's been struggling with anxiety their whole lives. That's not what I see. What I see is I've been doing this job enough and long enough that it's messing with me Mm -hmm. and I need to talk to somebody about it. Or I've watched other people go down this path and I don't want to. So I want to get ahead of the game. And I had, you know, I've, I've talked to younger folks and they're like, I can't believe I'm here already. And I'm like, no, you're here right on time. You figured it out. You have a bad call. You have a bad run. You come deal with it. Don't wait until you have 15 or 20 years of cumulative critical incidents and two divorces and your kids aren't talking to you and kid gets married or graduates and you all can't sit at a table together because it's so much tension, right? And we know that that happens. You probably know someone that it's happened to. Mm -hmm. All right. So you don't need to be crazy to hang out with us. Yeah, definitely not. What about, and this was touched on in episode one, the, the weakness. Yeah. The P word. But we don't call it the P word. Yeah, we're not going to call it the P word anymore. This idea that people that go to therapy are weak and they don't have enough willpower um, and they should be able to solve their own problems or I can solve my own problems. So I don't need a therapist. What comes to mind is that idea of like, I'm great at giving advice, but I can't take it. My dad has that line. He needs a T-shirt made. So I think I'll get it. It says take my advice. I'm not using it, which is such a dad joke, but also very true. Yeah. And part of that is like, of course we don't like when we have a dog in the fight, whatever objectivity we have in looking at our friend's situation where we're like, oh, well, it's clear as day. You should do this. (laughs) Right. When all of a sudden you're the one that has the dog in the fight, and it's your dog that can get injured or can lose, then we're not so go get them over that simple answer. We're going to be like, yeah, but what, right? We start weighing the, the negatives that can happen. And so the reality is, is we shouldn't just solve our own problems. It's not a should. And so therefore, it's just we have our own problems. And sometimes we can solve them on our own. And sometimes 
time solves them. And sometimes it helps to get a neutral third party involved to bounce things off of. Yeah. And we don't give advice. I learned a long time ago, I used to be a domestic violence counselor. And one of the things that I learned initially was you don't give advice because God forbid you, they take it. Right. And it goes wrong. Uh huh. You have to trust your clients to know ultimately what is best for them. Yes. And so we can plan, we can make suggestions, but we, we don't give advice. Like mm-hmm. that's not our role here. That's to help tease out the problem so you feel like you've got a solution. Yeah. That works for you. And anybody that's listening that's ever worked with me, and Cinnamon knows too, the thing I say all the time is you can't get yourself out of a situation with the same brain that got you into a situation, meaning you only have a certain amount of tools within your toolbox at any given moment. And so the idea of going outside of yourself to therapy, to a friend, to a coach, to whomever, but since we're talking about myth busting therapy, we'll say therapy for this is this idea of getting a couple extra tools in your tool belt so that you can have a perspective change, be able to see things through a different lens and a little bit differently. So in a way, that does mean you're solving your own problems. Like that's exactly what you're doing. You are solving your own problems with just an upgraded toolkit. Yeah. And what we know about the brain when it comes to stress And when there's a potential threat, right, whether it's, I don't want to get in trouble at work, I don't want to get in trouble at home, I what do I do? When we identify a threat, there's a part of our brain that's going to go offline. And it's not as accessible. So it's not that you can't solve your own problems. But when you are in the middle of a problem, you may not have access to your logic your moral compass, your beliefs, your imagination, your intellect, all of those things for good reason that we will get to that one day, we'll have that episode, is going to compromise your ability to do the things that you can do when it's somebody else's problem. Mm -hmm. Because the threat is for you, not your friend. But when it's your friend's relationship, your friend's job, then we are as wise as all get out. And that contributes to why it's always helpful to have somebody else help you solve those problems in tandem. Yeah. So what about this idea of you go to therapy, that means you're weak. That means you're the P word. Well, shit, then I'm weak. I know, me too. And if I'm weak, why the hell are people coming to talk to me to figure out how to solve problems? (laughs) You know, Again, I I also hear like, what's okay for them, but it's not okay for me. And so I would say it's not even for people that are weak. But if I go, I'm weak. It's it's both. But I definitely think that there's more of a personalization to it. And to me, and I will say this over and over and over again, the ability to step in to a situation where you say, I do not have all the answers and I need some support and assistance in getting through this chunk of time, this situation. That level of vulnerability takes way more strength than saying, I'm fine. I'm fine. No, no problem. I got this. That to me, to be able to say, I'm putting myself out there where you can judge me and my character is strong enough to endure that. And what's most important is my well-being, not what you think of me. That is what takes balls. Mm -hmm. Not saying, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Well, yeah. And what you just said about this judgment, that is another myth, this other idea, this myth that therapists, they're going to interrogate me, they're going to shame me, they're going to make me feel judged. That is another myth that I've noticed floats around there. Yeah. And I could go off on a tangent about how I can't make you feel anything. I know. Me too. But that, again, uh, bookmark that for another episode. That's not our goal, right? Like, how effective would be beating you down with the proverbial base bat be if we're trying... Base bat. Baseball bat. Thank you. A base bat. Do you don't know what a base bat is? Oh, you should probably Google that. She's shaming me. She's shaming me. I'm like, mm, not smart enough to know what a base bat is, are ya? Mm. Gonna write that down in my notebook. 
while I sat on my couch with my glasses on <laughs> and my chair in the corner. Um, yeah, we're not here to judge anyone. That's, I have no interest. No. And, and what's interesting is like people think that their problems are unique and that they need to harbor these secrets. And there's really very little that's shocking. I know to cinnamon anymore that she hasn't heard over and over and over again. So I want to kind of hone in on this very particular situation that I encounter a lot. And I think it ties directly into that judgment piece. I think that there's um, a lot of things that we think that we don't say because we think only bad people think those things, Mm. right? Like, I don't want to say it because, oh my God, it makes me sound like such a bad person. And the reality is I haven't met a bad person. I've, I've, I've encountered bad decisions and bad choices, but I haven't encountered bad people. And of all of those good people, they have always had those thoughts that they felt were only associated with bad people. And so what we see is if I think these thoughts, I must be bad. What we don't see is Mm -hmm. I'm a good person and I'm thinking these thoughts. So it doesn't take a bad person to think these thoughts. And so a lot of times I will come out in a session and say something very directly. Like, so it it sounds like you're concerned whether or not this marriage will last. Or it sounds like you are enjoying conversations with other people of the opposite sex Mm -hmm. because of, you know, whatever's happening at home. And people always want to like shy away from that. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is it. This is the moment. We get to be truthful and we get to work it out. It doesn't make you a bad person. We're not worrying about hurt, like filtering what we have to say to not hurt somebody else's feelings. We get to acknowledge that good people have all kinds of thoughts. And if we don't get honest, we don't get to go anywhere. If we're so worried about what it means about us, if we say that, that we don't, then we can't really deal with the problem. And whether that's in a couple session or an individual session, people have a hard time acknowledging that their truth is something that they would relate to only what a bad person would think. Mm -hmm. And that's just not true. Good people have all kinds of thoughts. and. Maybe it would be hurtful to someone else if they knew, but that's why we do confidentiality. Right. We're not going to call your wife. No. Or your husband. Or your mom. Or your mom. Or your sister, your brother. Or your kids. Or anybody. Yeah. Like, it really is if we can't be honest. And so when people are really surprised when I'm like, I don't feel the need to judge. I don't say that because that's supposed to be the company line of a therapist. I say that because I've seen so much that judging has no value. I have decided that everybody is got a legit reason for what they do, especially when it comes to mental health, even if it was what we would consider a bad decision. Hey there, listener. If you could ask any question or freely talk about any challenge related to being on the job and no one would know, what would you say? We are excited to share about our confidential hotline that we created just for you. Through this confidential hotline, you can leave a message sharing a success, a struggle, or simply ask a question. We will spotlight calls and offer feedback and insight from a licensed therapist and a certified coach who work exclusively with first responders. You can access our hotline voicemail by visiting afterthetonesdrop.com and clicking the voicemail tab. Additionally, you can join our mailing list if you'd like, or easily follow us on Facebook and Instagram for all the most recent updates. You know the drill. Tell a phone, tell a friend, tell a first responder. Yeah, so there's always an opportunity to come back from a bad decision. Absolutely. Oh, Ooh, I've taken you, your word. You have. What's next? What, what is one myth, Cinnamon, that stands out for you? I think one that I hear a lot is, 
like how long is this going to take? So whether they're expecting to feel better immediately after they start, which sometimes you can, just finally taking the plunge, meeting with a therapist, it you can feel better, but like that's not necessarily what we're going to look at. But I also think that a lot of people think that they have to go to therapy forever. Like it's like one of those things that once I start, I can't jump off or we're just going to keep finding more and more problems. And I don't think that that's necessarily true, but I also think that it can be true and can be beneficial. So, you know, we deal with a lot of folks who maybe come to see us initially for critical incidents. And what we find is after we get through their treatment plan, (laughs) Ben is walking around like he's in charge of the whole place. Ben is the dog. Ben the pug. Um, so uh, when they come in for the critical incident and we, you know, kind of identify what their treatment plan is, what the course of treatment is, then we might get to the end of that and they may want to set up what we would call like a maintenance schedule. So whether that's like once a month, once every six weeks, once every six months, um, it's the idea that our first responders are going to go back to work. And any given day, they're going to have another critical incident or another event. And so it's not that, oh, you're so broke (laughs) that you're going to take a lifetime to fix. It's that once you establish a relationship with a therapist, you might as well keep it going, even if they aren't weekly or biweekly appointments, but that you have this like touchstone to make sure hey, if something does start to slowly spiral downward, um, that you already have that in place. Because I know for us, if unless it's like an absolute emergency, which we will figure out ways to get people in on an emergency basis, but if it's just like, hey, I need an appointment, it may not be for a month and a half that you get in. So having something already on the calendar, to me, just makes sense. Yeah, well, it's the maintenance idea. It's kind of like you haven't been to the dentist in 15 years. You go, you get your x-rays, and all of a sudden you find out, oh, man, I got six cavities. I need a root canal. You know, like this tooth is chipped. So like that first couple months, it's like intensive. You're going in there. You're getting drilled. You know, you're doing the work. Yes. And then after that, all of those things are resolved and fixed, but you're going back for your cleanings so they can make sure your fillings haven't fallen out. It's that whole maintenance program so you can keep up that healthy mouth. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Who doesn't need a healthy mouth? And a healthy brain. And a healthy brain. And I've seen it work, right? Where people have successfully completed a treatment plan that they had built with their therapist built with me. And then for, you know, however many visits, things are fine. And then they come back in just one day and it's like, what's going on? And they're like, I'm having a hard time. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm perfect. You're in the right place. We're having a hard time. And how do we, you know, make those adjustments, have those conversations to get one back on track. So it doesn't get to the point where you have six cavities again. Mm Mm-hmm. Six therapeutic. And cavities. believe it or not, listeners, we have people that were kicking and screaming coming in here. Ugh. And now they can't imagine not coming. Yeah, or it, it's like we can't break up. Right? <laughs> we're not breaking up. <laughs> breaking up is hard to do. I know. Well, and I think we also have a lot of spouses that are like, you don't get to not go. Like that is, you know. The relationship has improved. Their ability to communicate has improved. Their relationship with kids and other family members have improved. And so spouses are very encouraging. Like, whatever you're doing, please keep doing it um, because it's making our family better. It's not a punishment. No. I think it's a privilege to come hang out with us. Yes. I mean, we are the bee's knees. (laughs) So I hear. (laughs) That's the rumor out there. (laughs) I think my sticker that says save the bees and their knees. Well, this lady across from me loves to talk about childhood trauma, loves to talk about things that we bring from childhood, and we'll get into that down the road. But 
That's something that often we hear too. Another myth with therapy is that all they're going to do is make me talk about my past relationships with my parents and how crappy or whatever my upbringing was or like what was lacking from my childhood. So basically that all of my problems are about my childhood and let's, let's talk about, let's talk about your parents. Let's talk about what it was like. Okay, so I am a little guilty of this. However, I don't think that, you know, if you're coming in for GD, Ben, um, if you're coming in for like a specific issue, um, let's say there was a critical incident or you had a, a particular event or you're experiencing particular symptoms, that is not necessarily where we're going to go down the rabbit hole of your childhood. What we are finding, though, is there is a direct correlation. And it's not about your parents being shitty parents. Mm-hmm. It's, it's about we acknowledge parents, whether it was last generation, our generation, the generations to come, everybody's just doing the best they can. Yep. And when people say to me, I just worry I'm going to like screw my kids up and they're going to be in therapy. I'm like, stop worrying. You are and they will. <laughs> well, and, the, and we joke like that. But the truth is that we are doing the best that we can. Yeah. And there is no handbook to no. parenting, to raising a family, to marriage even, to any of it. We just, one day we turn 18 and somebody says, hey, you're 18 now. You're an adult. Yeah. Even though you don't have a fully functioning brain until you're 25, we're going to send you out seven years early with an incompletely developed or built brain. Yeah. So the point is that everybody is doing the best that they can. And sometimes it's not that fantastic. And it does leave a lasting impression that makes a difference that trickles into your adulthood. So just even a a lay example would be, let's say my, my mom is afraid of water. And her fear translated into my own fear. Mm -hmm. So if I'm you know, doing a river rescue and I panic and I need to resolve it. Well, yeah, like it might come up. Where did this, where did this panic come from? Where did this anxiety and worry come from? Well, I've always been worried about water. Okay. Well, what, what was happening that led you you to always be worrying about water? Well, my, my mom didn't like the water and, and maybe that could have come from her parents. Like it's just really figuring out what the source is. It's not necessarily to blame your mom for being afraid of water. It's for backtracking. And we know that we get taught both their beliefs as well as their fears, right? So Mm -hmm. we know we're trying to instill values in our kids. And we also know that because they're watching us, we inadvertently instill fears in them too. Mm -hmm. Um, So... I say all of that to say, we're not blaming your problem on your parents, but we are finding that when we have experienced certain things, now remember as children, if we're thinking about trauma, it's an overwhelm of the brain, the body, and our coping skills. And I know for one, I had crappy coping skills as a kid Mm -hmm. because I'm a kid. You know, like I have 10 years of lived experience at the age of 10. I don't know how to deal with everything. So there's so much more that's going to be traumatic. Yeah. um, And that's going to, even if it's not traumatic in the sense that I'm going to end up with PTSD, it can be left an impression on me. And so we do look back and say, okay, where did this pattern start? Where is the first time? And a lot of times the interventions that we use for trauma is going back to what we call the triad of worst, first, and most recent. And when you're looking at what happened first, it may be, okay, well, I responded this way in a river rescue because I also responded this way at, you know, swim camp. Mm -hmm. And that is maybe a piss poor example, but it's the one that I just pulled out. No, that, that makes sense. And... If I don't stop her now, we will talk about this until the sun sets. All right. Give me another one. Okay. You can't help. Oh, no. Yeah, this one. I love this one, actually. It's a counselor doesn't know me and he or she can't help me. Well, thank God we don't know you. 
You have someone without a dog in the fight. That is what Cinnamon always says. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have a dog in the fight. So it makes that when we talk about like, oh, I'm really good at giving advice, but I'm terrible at taking it. It is because when it is our personal subjective experience, the factors, the costs are so personal to us that we don't have that same clarity. Whereas we can give advice to friends all day and we can see so clearly what the answer is. And so to be able to talk to somebody that isn't your spouse, isn't your parent, isn't a coworker, isn't your boss, isn't your kids, isn't Mm -hmm. your buddy who has a, a, a spouse who's buddies with your spouse, right? Like we literally don't have any of those connections and we're just looking at a more objective, like we are still human. So we are not completely objective, um, but it gives us more options to look at things. And be neutral. And to be neutral. Half the time when it's somebody that know, that does know us, in fact, they're bringing years of baggage into the particular situation as well. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but it's hard to be subjective in those moments because they've seen it before or here we go again or whatnot. Well, I also think that when we're discussing this with like discussing problems with Mm -hmm. friends and Aaron and I do this when we take our business partner hat off and put back on our best friend hat, it's we might tell the other one, but we've been telling each other things for 12 years. So I've got this whole history downloaded and she can say something to me. I'm like, oh, I know. Right. (laughs) Like I get why I get where you're coming from. As a therapist, if Erin is my client and, I'm at, and she tells me that, I'm going to not make that assumption and not make that connection. And I'm going to make her articulate why that thing is so negative, mm-hmm. right? So instead of saying, oh, I get it, oh, or I hear in your tone that this is a negative thing, and I pick up on that and I'm like, yeah, and we just let it go. I'm like, no, explain this to me. Explain your thought process of why this is a negative thing. Mm -hmm. And then that person has to articulate. And sometimes that's where you find the answers. Yes. It's what I call looking at the monster under the bed, right? They're like, oh, it'll be bad. I'm like, okay, well, let's play that out. What if it does happen? Yeah. When they keep talking, then the light bulb goes off often too. You can keep them talking, then there's a good chance they're going to get to the meat and the potatoes, if you will. Well, and that's why I like the phrase, I ask people, does this resonate with you? Mm -hmm. not is this the right answer? Is this the wrong answer? Is this exactly how you feel? But is anything of what I said, does any of it resonate with you? And then, okay, which parts, if any, and then we kind of, you know, go with that. But I do think that as great as friends and peers are, and we definitely want to have healthy communication in couples, I don't want to take away from the benefit of having that objective third party that doesn't have a dog in the fight Mm -hmm. uh, and what they can add to that, right? So ask your friends, ask your neighbors, ask your spouse, and also talk to a therapist. Yes. And speaking of talking to a therapist, the myth of, but people will know I'm seeing a counselor or I don't want people to know I'm seeing a counselor, that whole idea. To me, this is First off, the only way people will know that you're seeing a counselor is if you tell them. Right. Because why? Because of confidentiality. Exactly. And this is so important. And I feel very strongly about this one. If my outlook is, oh my gosh, somebody's going to find out that I'm in therapy. Right there, that is shame. That is, somebody's going to think negatively of me. I love those folks who are like, well, yeah, I'm in therapy. Do you know what I do? Of course I'm in therapy. And so this isn't really about anybody else. This is about your personal choice about disclosure. And then it is also the attitude that you take about it. Because I feel like you have way more of an opportunity to be a role model if you are able to say, yep, if you tell people, people will know you're you're seeing a counselor. And... Like, why is that innately a negative? People will know. And again, your personal choice. But I would like to add that spin. Hey, if I'm going to go to therapy, 
And I'm a leader in my department, that I'm a, a game changer in my department, then hell yeah, I'm going to be like, I'm going to therapy. Like I'm going to participate in normalizing that mm-hmm. rather than, you know, creeping around and, and being, you know, scared somebody's going to find out. And I always say, man, if I could have like a team roster and people could see who all's with me, who's all with me, there would be no more stigma. And I would assume that every clinician that does this kind of work where, you know, I've had people walk in my office as somebody was walking out and they're like, oh my God, that was my mentor. I had no idea they were coming, you know, and, and maybe I would have been here sooner if I had. Yeah. Like if it, if it, whether or not, you know, it, there are people that you respect that have already sought out help. Mm -hmm. And, and that might be part of the reason why you respect them and you don't even know it. Pow. Yeah. I don't know if that's an appropriate sound. Pow. Like I, you know, like cartoon. Pow. I visualized it. You did? You saw like the, the pointy talk bubble mm-hmm. around it that was like poof, poof, with the superheroes. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Anywho, people might know, and I hope they know, but it won't be from us. Yeah. So we'll put it that way. And people will try to talk about other people. Oh, yeah, that's fun. And, you know, the reality is they're still not getting anything (laughs) because we would never admit that we know what you're talking about. We know that person. People talk amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. And so they know. And it's one of those things where you get to have confidentiality and you get to break your own confidentiality whenever and how you choose. Mm -hmm. That does not give us permission. So we just can't really do that. So the long and the short of it is it's your choice if people know that you're seeing a counselor. That's it. And instead of making that a bad thing, we can turn it into a good thing. Mm -hmm. Hell yeah, people know I'm seeing a counselor. Yep. I'm changing the culture in my department by sharing that information because I don't want another one of my brothers or sisters to die. Yep. I mean, that was what it comes down to. That is what it comes down to. All right. So therapy doesn't work. That is, no. Okay. Let me rephrase. (laughs) That is not a statement. That is actually a myth that I probably should have uh, started the sentence differently. So the myth is. The myth is. People people say and think that therapy doesn't work. And you're right. You can't just go get done therapy. Like, you can't just, like, Botox or... Like, osmosis. I sit in the therapy chair and I get well. Right. You know, we give out homework. We give ideas of observation. Like, let's pay attention to this this week. You know, sometimes it's hard work outside of therapy. Sometimes it's not so hard work. But the reality is, is coming and seeing us isn't necessarily going to solve all your problems. And but I, put I know, your back into it. I know it's like you can go sit in a church, but that doesn't mean you're going to find religion. Or you can go yeah. in a gym and sit there and watch everybody pump iron, and that doesn't mean you're going to get muscles. It's the same idea. And let's be honest, I think we all would like that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, I laid my head down in algebra all the time on my algebra book. I still don't know what Y is. <laughs> Right. Like, it's (laughs) just not how it works. Mm -hmm. So, yes, um, therapy works if you work it. That's right. Yeah. Got to have skin in the game for it to work. Absolutely. But it will work. But it will work. Mm -hmm. Which goes to let's kind of like wrap up with our last one. And I hear this pretty frequently. And it's usually said in a joking manner. Um, I used to hear this more years ago before we kind of like started talking more about mental health in everyday conversations rather than just in those exclusive moments. And that is, I am beyond help. And what I have found is, no, you're not. No, you're not. You're just not. Like no matter how bad it is, no matter how cemented you are into your practices and behaviors, there is always something that you can learn about yourself about how to handle situations, how to communicate, how to ask for your needs to be met, how to meet other people's needs, how to be a member of society. 
Mm-hmm. The belief that one is beyond help is a fear-driven belief. It is a statement mm-hmm. that, and this could be very opinionated, and I'm willing to take that on, but it's a statement that, oh man, facing this stuff feels hard or scary, or I am so messed up, there's no possible way, or I've lived like this for so damn long, there's no possible way anything could feel different than the way it's felt for all these years. And to me, that feels like a fearful thing. I Or they don't want to get their hopes up. I was just going to say, this feels like that I'd rather live in disappointment Mm -hmm. than be disappointed. So if I come in low and say, I am beyond help, Mm -hmm. then I will not be disappointed or crushed when I actually try therapy and it doesn't work. So if I am afraid that whatever is going on with me cannot be resolved, it is a very safe thing to say that it won't work because then... I can't be disappointed. I'm just living in that bottom margin of disappointment. I'm beyond help. Nothing's going to work. I might as well just stay like this and not even give it a try rather than, well, I watch other people go to therapy and I see other people improve. So I'm going to go. And then we have that fear that it's not going to get better. And so we just give up before we ever get started to avoid disappointment. Yeah. And we do that in a lot of ways in life. Tons. Outside of just therapy. Yeah. Well, I, I call it the this old dress mentality. Like if I come down the stairs and I say to my husband, look, Ed, don't I look so pretty? And he just kind of like gives me a side eye. It's going to feel shitty. But mm-hmm. if I come downstairs and the first thing I say is, oh, my God, I feel so fat and ugly in this outfit. What is he going to do? No, babe, you look great. And I'm like, no, stop. I just, I just, this whole thing, I just pulled it out of the closet. And so what I'm doing is I'm coming in low and putting the emotional labor on him Mm -hmm. because I am afraid that if I come in high, I'm going to get knocked down. So it's that toxic Midwestern humility. That could be a whole episode. Of toxic Midwestern humility? Yes. Is it just Midwestern? I don't know, but I feel like we're so supposedly nice Mm -hmm. that that's just something that we do yeah along with like a midwestern goodbye where we walk people to the foyer and then we walk out on the porch and then they walk to their car but then we like walk to their car (laughs) like we don't know how to say or when to say goodbye um god bless the midwest the the middle west So of all of these, like maybe the list we covered today isn't something that you had. If you have another belief about therapy that you want us to bust, please feel free to call the hotline and we can either use your hotline call or we can just take the question and have it as part of one of our discussions. Also, you can always hop on Instagram or Facebook and follow us and ask a question there. There are ways. And we do monitor messages and things like that. So yeah, I mean, I think that don't knock it until you try it. And if you try it and it, and it doesn't feel like a good fit, go find someone else. And feel free to interview people, like go to multiple therapists to find something that fits you. And also like interview your therapist. Most therapists will have like a free consultation or at least they'll have some conversation with you before your session. And that's where, do your research, well, what interventions do you use? Have you been trained in cultural competency for first responders? Do you specialize in you know, drugs, alcohol, trauma? Like how many first responders do you see? You can ask those questions to get a better idea. And also word of mouth. We don't advertise. Like our private practice doesn't advertise anymore. We used to, but it was ineffective. And what I found was I was declining more clients because they weren't in my specialty niche where the word of mouth 
is, hey, I know a therapist, you should go talk to this person. And that is what we see most effective because you can Google it, you can read on Psychology Today, you can do whatever. But at the end of the day, you're going to trust your brothers and sisters to give you the name of somebody who will do right by you. That's right. And also, if you're going to do it, and we definitely encourage you to try it out, be open-minded. Do not set yourself up to lose by going in there with the intent to bust it. Right. Like, I I met my therapist and nope. Yeah. I found out that they really only take crazy people. Yeah. All the myths were true. All Uh, right. Then we'll just go find more myths. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, I feel good about promoting a healthy perspective on therapy. And maybe we can talk about barriers another episode and how to solve those. So like maybe after we bust through the myths, now we've got to deal with the barriers like insurance or finance. And and we can have a separate conversation about that. But I think it's just important as and key to first responder mental health and wellness is that we address as soon as possible in this podcast, the things that we have heard repeatedly about why people aren't going and give solid examples of how that's not true in every case and what the advantages are or even how to spin that myth into, yeah, people will find out that I'm going to therapy and I am cool with that. And, and I'm cool with that. And, you know, I'm contributing to the greater good of my department and my community. So I feel like we hit this one on the head. Yeah. With my uh, base bat. Base bat. Base bat. And <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> I, I'm going to sketch a drawing of what a base bat would look like. And listen to, uh, you can always check our show notes. We always have information, resources. resources, supportive stuff with everything that we do. So we'll see y'all soon. Take care. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of After the Tones Drop. Today's show has been brought to you by Whole House Counseling. As a note, After the Tones Drop is for informational purposes only and does not constitute for medical or psychological advice. It is not a substitute for professional health care advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Please contact a local mental health professional in your area if you are in need of any assistance. You can also visit afterthetonesdrop.com and click on our resources tab for an abundance of helpful information. And we would like to give a very special thank you and shout out to Venz Adams, Yeti, and Sonda for our show's music.